Guys naming dudes NFL draft edition with Brett Coleman. We're not going to be talking about the first round draft picks. We're talking about the sleepers and Brett Coleman. He's been DMing me names of prospects of guys I have not heard about. So that's what we're going to get here with Brett Coleman. How you doing? I'm great. Let's talk about some Louisville running backs that yes. are going to go in the sixth round, baby. That's that's what we're here for. <laughs> some of these guys do hit, though, so make sure to stick around. Uh, I'm going to be looking at the consensus big board. We're going to go by position here. We're going to kick it off with the quarterbacks. The first round guys, to me, Caleb Williams, Drake May, Jaden Daniels, those guys are basically locked to go, probably in the top 10 picks. It's a battle for quarterback four, and that's where we're going to start the discussion today. Bo Nix, J.J. McCarthy, Michael Penix, any of those names standing out to you? So what's really hard about uh, the race for QB4, I guess you can call it a race at this point, because uh, all these guys are, are trying to get the four spot. Jaden Daniels pretty locked into three. Uh, but the thing about the race for QB4 is they're all very different evaluations, and they're all difficult in their own right. Um, if you look at J.J. McCarthy, for instance, he has a lot of tools. Yep. He's a great dude. He's tough as nails. Like, he has every trait physically and mentally that you could ask for. We just didn't get to see him throw the ball that much. He had 21 to 22 attempts per game, 24 total dropbacks per game. You know, they ran the ball over and over and over again until you made them stop, which basically nobody ever made them stop. And then starting with the Penn State game, where he only threw eight passes in that game, but he was injured in that game, and then that injury carried over for four weeks, basically until they got a month off leading up Mm -hmm. to the playoffs where he finally got healthy. But those were a lot of the best teams he played against, yep. right? Because of that, we just don't have a lot of NFL throws that we can study. For instance, you know, one of the, the staple throws that's kind of like a, a do not pass go, do not collect $200, you got to be able to do this in the NFL, is being able to throw a go ball from the far hash. C.J. Stroud, that was like one of his best throws because it shows, hey, I'm on this hash, I can mm-hmm. attack every inch of the field, including all the way to the opposite boundary, 20-plus yards down the field. J.J. had three of those the entire year. Dang. Right. So how do we evaluate that? Doesn't mean he can't do it. We just haven't seen it. Yeah. So I I believe Dane Brugler, when uh, Dane Brugler, one of the preeminent draft voices, he said he's going to go top 12. Like, I believe it. Right. It's just hard. It's, it's a roll of the dice for sure. I am a J.J. McCarthy guy because he's mobile. He plays under center more than the other quarterbacks do. Keith is also willing to throw the ball over the middle. I'm with you. His biggest concern is raw arm strength. I think that he's fairly accurate. He can throw it on the run, which is crucial in today's NFL. He's going to be more athletic than people think. It's the arm strength, but I'm going back. He played as a 19-year-old, as a 20-year-old. I think there's room on his frame to add some weight. I think he will get stronger. I do think that his arm strength will improve. I think that's his biggest flaw, and I think that there's rooms for improvement with it. So I'm with Dane. I think that he's going to be the quarterback for, and that brings us to Bo Nix and uh, Michael Penix here. Do you think that either one of these guys has a realistic chance to go round one? Probably Nix more so than Penix, I agree. if I had to guess. Um, they're both older prospects, much older prospects than, than some of these guys that are in the class. Um, Nix, what makes him tough is he has one of the lowest – uh, average depth of targets in this class. I want to say it's bottom six among all FBS quarterbacks yes. in average depth of target, but he's also top six in yards per attempt. Like He's very accurate on these balls in terms of setting up yards after catch opportunities, explosive yards after catch opportunities. You could argue explosiveness through efficiency, right? right. Um, he's basically tailor-made for a quick game oriented offense, like what we see playing in the Super Bowl this year with Kyle yep. Shanahan. Like, There's nothing on Nix's tape to me that says he can't do what Brock Purdy does. He's also got some mobility, Mm -hmm. uh, like very mature, very coachable. It's just we don't see him ever attack down the field. So it's a similar thing with McCarthy. And that's what makes me nervous is he is a maxed out player because he's been around for so long. So to me, it's harder to see the true upside appeal. So I wouldn't be surprised if he did slide into round two. To me, he's very clearly below J.J. McCarthy on my big board. And then even lower than that is Michael Penix. When I watched Michael Penix from Washington, very fun offense. If you're a Seahawks fan, you're getting their offensive coordinator. I think you should be pretty stoked about what that's going to be bringing. I think it's perfect for Geno Smith. But with Michael Penix, I just thought that he did not provide basically any mobility. And I thought that he, while he does have arm strength, he didn't have the touch 
and the kind of layering in throws. And that's kind of what had me nervous for Michael Penix. Long injury history. He's been in the game for a long time. And those type of traits, I don't think you're going to be able to coach those into him. So he's kind of like with Bo Nix, kind of a maxed out player in my eyes. He's a human trebuchet in the sense that it's it's a stationary mm-hmm. weapon. They can sling it. But it, it's going to attack down the field. That's right? right. He was one of the only – quarter. there's two quarterbacks in all of FBS that had more than 100 temp, uh, just attempts mm-hmm. of 20-plus yards. Yeah. He had 104. Yeah. That is absurd. Now, he was playing behind one of the best offensive lines in college football. He had a receiving core that would probably all start for the Chiefs yeah. like this weekend. Um, so there, there was a lot of talent around him. And when he was kept clean, again, he's like a trebuchet. He's just going to absolutely bomb mm-hmm. you. Um the thing is, when he's not kept clean, it's a completely different player. And I ha- not to inundate you with statistics, but if we're just looking at pressure versus no pressure splits, when there's no pressure, 76.6% adjusted completion percentage. That takes out like throwaways yeah. and stuff like that. Down to 53.3% with pressure. Uh, in terms of touchdown to interception ratio, no pressure, 30 to 7. With pressure, 6 to 5. If we're looking at turnover worthy play differential, 1.1% with no pressure, that's amazing. Right. 4.1% oh, with no. pressure, that's throwing the ball into traffic. 9.0 yards per attempt with no pressure, 7.2 uh, with pressure. And then if we're just looking at raw passer rating, 115.3, no pressure. With pressure, 63.9. Like, it's a completely different player, right? Whereas J.J. McCarthy under pressure, 9.3 yards per attempt, 8-3 to touchdown interception ratio, Mm -hmm. 74% completions. Like, J.J.'s much better under pressure because I think he's a better athlete. Honestly, Penix is going to be treated a lot like Goff. That's what I was just saying, that these are the exact kind of splits that we're talking with. But I think with Goff, his accuracy and touch – He's I think was worthy of like a top 10 selection yeah. in Michael Penix. Also, Goff didn't have the lengthy history that Michael Penix has. So those are your consensus top six. I'm leaning towards McCarthy getting closer to the top three, kind of distancing himself from these other two guys. And then there's players like Spencer Rat- Rattler, Michael Pratt, Jordan Davis, Sam Hartman. Any of these guys have a chance to be, let's say, like round three picks. Any of these guys stand out or should we move on? Uh, Rattler for sure going day two. Um, Jordan Travis, I think, for sure going day two. Wow, okay. Um, potentially both in the second round, honestly. If I'm not to give like too much of a hot take here, I would not be surprised if Jordan Travis goes ahead of Penix. Okay. I, I think there's a chance that Penix falls further than people want to believe right now. I, I think Jordan Travis is a really good – like he is like the ideal Jordan Love route candidate. Okay, wow. Of like here's a kid with tools. Okay. He's very coachable. Had a, a, a lot to love on his tape isn't quite there with the others yet but it doesn't mean that he's maxed out he still has room to grow and like what we saw with Jordan Love it's just about going to the right situation where that talent can be honed into you know basically an assassin by the end of the year is what Jordan Love was I think Jordan Travis could very easily be that kind of of guy and Spencer Rattler as well you know had a lot of struggles early in his career got humbled which was probably needed right and now like he's a new he's a new man and a new player and I think both of them could go in the second round. Okay, Josh and I will have videos on those two guys beyond the top six now that we have the chance of round two, round three buzz with them. Now it's time for wide receivers, and it has been an awesome class just to me on my first go around with it. Bigger wide receivers. It's been a couple of years since we got legit size from this wide receiver class, so we're going to try to not talk about the round one guys. Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze, and then I think that Brian Thomas are going to be locks for round one. Uh, do you think there's any chance Brian Thomas falls to round two? Probably not. Mm, I would be stunned if he got by Casey. Okay, so we'll we'll pause with those guys. Hopefully you guys already know who those players are. Now we have a, a quite the list here. Keon Coleman, Troy Franklin, A.D. Mitchell, Lad McConkey. We'll start there with those uh four wide receivers, who stands out to you? So, you didn't say stand out positively. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, we'll, we'll get through all of them. I'm going to go the other way okay. uh, with it. Just And I apologize to any Ducks fans. I don't see it with Troy Franklin. Okay. Like I know he's going to go on day two. Why not? There's tools, right? He's tall, fast, but he is a buck 85 to buck 90 playing weight. He is slender. Uh, he has a 30% contested catch rate that is not good that's about half of what you're hoping for right on the top end of contested catch rates comparison Roma Dunze is at 80 percent which is absurd and way bigger and way bigger, <laughs> way bigger. <laughs> yeah weighs him by like 30 pounds right, right. um he also has close to a 10 percent drop rate I think 
he's shifty and bursty, but if you just touch him at all and knocks him off court, like he's just not very big, right. doesn't fight through contact super well. He strikes me as an MVS type of player. Right. This is like the profile that we had with Jalen Hyatt last year. Uh, if it works out, it could look like Tank Dell, where you get play action, post routes, off the line of scrimmage, creative offensive coordinator, and you can get somebody that – with the right quarterback can be productive but with troy franklin i agree the size was an issue for him a player also in this class might as well get to him real quick xavier worthy similar size similar kind of route tree at texas uh i had issues with xavier worthy working over the middle of the field facing press man coverage had some drop issues at the catch point as well just because if you get hands on him the route completely changes. What was your overall thoughts on Xavier Worthy? The high-end comp, and I was talking to Nick Arcolano about this, the high-end comp everybody's going to throw out is like Deshaun Jackson, right? High. High praise. High, high, high-end right. comp. The more realistic comp is probably Travis Benjamin Okay. to me. Similar okay. size, or at least similar weight, similar role. He's going to be the guy who maybe gets three catches in a game but could go mm-hmm. for 85 yards and a touchdown. So for best ball specifically, I mean, we are on the underdog channel. That's facts. Best ball specifically – He's going to be somebody you actually do want to invest in in pretty late rounds uh, just because at any given moment he can pop off. But I don't think week-to-week consistency, he doesn't strike me as the type of receiver that's going to be like, oh, I can count on five catches for 70 yards. I've seen both Troy Franklin and Xavier Worthy in round one mock drafts. I've seen consensus round one grades on them. I'm with you. I see these guys as role players, number two, maybe probably more likely number three receivers. And and good ones. Decent ones. They they provide a role, but I I do think that the lack of size is going to come back to bite them. So, all right, what about the, the other... The big guys, Keon Coleman, A.D. Mitchell, between those two. I love A.D. Mitchell. Okay, sell me. He's my wide receiver four. Wow. Uh, It's either him or Brian Thomas Jr. They're right there. You could could sell me either one as wide receiver four uh, behind the big three of of Marv Neighbors and Rome. A.D. for his size, again, he's another big body receiver, but he's so loose in the hips. His feet are so good. And the way he runs routes, he he has kind of an interesting trait that you don't see very often. And it's very C.D. Lamb-ish. He gets in and out of breaks without losing speed. Mm-hmm. Like, he doesn't slow down. It just, it's, it's like the Tron motorcycles, right? It just goes. Yep. I think he's a, a fascinating receiver prospect because the production profile is not, like, amazing. That's like the, the deep analytics Twitter is got some flags on him. But if you just look at him, you're like, oh, my God, that's an NFL receiver. Right. And he beat some really good corners this year. Yes. The... <laughs> The size is there. He has X receiver potential. I did see him win on a lot of double moves at Texas, which is a good thing and a bad thing. There were some times where I thought he would stumble out of his breaks a couple times, but the athletic traits are there. It's just really weird. The 1.7 yards per route run, the 9% first down uh, rate on his routes are very low. So that's going to be the thing we have to battle. I think that the NFL Combine is going to kind of win either if it's late first round or if he's going to be a mid-second round pick. But he has plenty of potential, kind of like on the George Pickens-esh kind of wavelength of what he's going to be in the NFL. What about Keon uh, Coleman? Because he is very talked about. Uh, some people don't think that he can separate. Some people just think he's a uh, kind of a dunker out in the middle of the field. Where do you kind of land? It's, it's funny. That's actually a story that I heard from his teammates at Florida State that I was interviewing at the Shrine Bowl. Their first interaction with Keon Coleman was at, uh, uh, oh my God, yes. Oh, that's very clear to me. Yeah. Mike Norvell had a, a, a barbecue for the team like right after Keon got there when they got him from Michigan State. And he shows up in like skinny jeans and vans and starts windmill dunking of on course. people. Like his, his vertical is nuts. Yeah. Long speed, I, I don't think it's going to be anywhere near some of the guys in the, in the very, very top of this class. But he's got vertical. He's got balls, like great ball skills. Unbelievable ball skills. He made that one catch in coverage that yeah. he caught it about from back here. Yeah, he's like he can track it, right? Which right. the job description is wide receiver. Like you mm-hmm. got to be able to catch and he can, he can catch. He's big. He's physical. He's not going to get pushed around as much as some of the the more slender guys in this class. I have him below AD and BTJ just because I think yeah. you know the separation thing is is real. A lot of starting NFL caliber quarterbacks are not going to worry as much about can he separate and more so can he just be strong enough to hold the leverage mm-hmm. late into the route so I can throw with his leverage and place it where he can get it. Jordan Travis, that's part of the reason why I think 
like Jordan Travis is really good is because he mastered understanding what Keon Coleman is and just working mm-hmm. with leverage and making really, really good leverage throws down the field. Yep. Some top NFL quarterbacks are going to do that in their sleep. So there is a path for him to be very, very productive just based on those traits. I did not see a full route tree from Keon Coleman. I saw all the contested ability. I'm very curious whether the 40 time is going to be because it didn't seem like he had that act, that last gear like some of the other round one guys. But we see the, this type of profile, like when it hits well, like you get your T. Higgins types in round two. Um, when it doesn't work out, you can see these guys kind of move out out of the league or out of starting roles very quickly. So uh, late risers, we have senior bowl guys, Lad McConkey, Roman Wilson, and then Devontae Walker. Lad McConkey, I've seen him now in round one. I was super impressed with his tape, his route running is very good he can really tempo his routes he's not a slot receiver only slant routes only this guy was cooking dudes on the outside with double moves he can run the post route he can run run in breaking routes uh what were your overall uh expectations for lad mcconkey and then versus guys like roman wilson also down there in the senior bowl i think it's a great fit for carolina at 33 Yes. Somebody could just get open, right? Okay. And he gives me Emmanuel Sanders vibes. Wow. For that reason of just like get open. Yep. Is he ever going to be a high end number one? Probably not, just because again, he's a buck 85. Mm-hmm. And he, he probably will live more inside the slot than outside mm-hmm. in the NFL because of that reason. Not that he can't play outside, but. But he can work at least downfield, if he, even if he yes. is a slot receiver. He doesn't get knocked off track as much as, as Franklin right. does, right? He's not as tall as Franklin, which means that 185 goes a little bit further. He's a little thicker, a little stronger. And not to mention, he's just a great route runner, a great separator. So he'll probably live in the slot just because of the positive traits more so than the negative ones. It's just more, where can we maximize them? That's inside. But I think he's a natural fit at Carolina just because they need guys that can get open. Yes. And just like Emmanuel Sanders, who was never a top-end number one, but he was a high-quality number two. For championship-level teams. Forever, yep. right? And I, I think that's what he's going to be and okay. and be pretty good early. Yeah, Ladd McConkey, uh, Field Yates believes that he can be a round one player, and he's doing a bunch of NFL draft stuff with ESPN, of course. Roman Wilson. Now, this to me is like a true slot receiver, like the classic types. There's a lot of a Monroe St. Brown usage uh, with Roman Wilson out of Michigan. What was your overall feel for Roman? I know a lot of people have also compared him to Tyler Lockett, where if he's not working inside, he's at least a Z outside. Okay. Where he's got a little bit more space to operate. Because, again, he's another one of these guys that's like sub 190. Yes. But I hope got... he can run that fast like Lockett. That would be a, a little bit of a surprise to me. I've heard 4 3. Wow. If he runs 4-3, get ready to be drafting Roman Wilson a lot earlier than where he's currently going. And again, he was in an offense that didn't throw the ball. Like it's the same kind of thing we talk about J.J. McCarthy. Just because we didn't see a lot of deep targets for Rome, or at least as many as, as we mm-hmm. could have, doesn't mean he can't do it. Right. And he showed up at the Senior Bowl, you know, was going toe-to-toe with Quinnon Mitchell, who's going to be a top-20 pick at corner. Yep. And, like, they were... They were going back and forth, right? So I think you look at the size profile, you look at the speed, and Tyler's never been an X, but he has played outside Mm -hmm. because as a Z, you know, you're kind of getting him in motion more, you're giving him more free releases, and you just let the speed go to work. I agree 100% as a slot receiver would totally work. Yes. But I think if he goes to, say, Seattle, second round, like there's your Outside. there's your heir apparent to Tyler. Wow. You got JSN in the slot, DK's at the X, and he, he it's more of a dynasty thing at that right. point than than a year one thing. But like that's the exact type of receiver they want. Very interesting. That's the exact type of receiver that a lot of teams want. Yeah, it's like just give me a dude who can go win deep. A reliable slot receiver that can also run four three and win on the outside. It seems like a player that is going to go earlier than people think. Seventy eight percent of his catchable targets went for first downs. So that is as efficient as it gets. A player that I was kind of low on watching was Tez Walker out of North Carolina. Classic vertical receiver. Basically, that's all he does, and that was kind of my concern with him. Not a whole lot of in-breaking routes, not a whole lot of bend in my eyes. And if you are going to be that type of player where you only win downfield well, better get ready to learn contested catches. And I did not think that he had the greatest hands. What were your impressions? I still have to do more work on him because my first impression was he had a better year at Kent State before he transferred. Correct. And I watched the Kent State, and he's going up against Georgia corners, right, and just running right by him. Like, the speed is real. Um, and, he, and he put on a little bit of weight um, going into this past season. Like, good weight. I'm not saying he, like, got fat or anything like right. that. It's more so just trying to get rocked up, right? Um, and I, I think he was still trying to figure out how to handle – that 
last year. And you would expect, oh, he's going to play with Drake May. The numbers are going to be better. The tape is mm-hmm. going to be better. I, I really think he was just trying to get used to being 10 pounds heavier than he was. And it impacted a lot of things. But I go back to the Kent State tape, and I'm like, man, there's something right. there. Because he was catching everything over really good corners and just dusting people. Like, I know there's something there. Mm-hmm. If it's between him and Troy Franklin, I'd probably take him over. I'm not by a lot, but I'd probably take him over Franklin just because I trust the Kent State tape that much. Got it. Okay, yeah, this to me is like when you get in your boom bust downfield right, wide receivers. My comp kind of was like Alec Pierce where – you're not going to get anything kind of over the middle or in breaking curls. And Alec Pierce wasn't the greatest in the contested catch situation, but the speed is real and has got some good size. Any wide receiver sleepers that we have not gotten to, I'm not sure if you have Xavier Leggett takes, if there's Ricky Purcell, or if you're going to go deeper, Jermaine Burton, who's like the deep sleeper that Brett is Brett wants everyone to draft. I got a few. Okay, hit me. Malachi Corley. Okay. Western Kentucky. Yards after the catch. He's, he's not Debo. But he's not that far off. I'd say it's, wow. it's somewhere in between like Debo and Khalil Shakir, who both were in the same same neighborhood but different houses in right. terms of like yards after catch threats, faster with the ball in their hands than not. Debo has like a molten iron corn core, core yeah. to him, right? So he bounces just, off guys. Like it's it's insane how strong he is. Khalil's not that strong. Malachi's stronger than Khalil, so he's like if mm-hmm. there, if that's like the spectrum, he's in the middle of it. Uh, but I think he has extreme juice for a 210 pound receiver like i absolutely love him with the ball in his hands he went to the senior bowl to prove he could win more down the field just because he wasn't given that many opportunities to do so in that western kentucky offense and i thought he acquitted himself well so he's gonna be another guy who i think could go in the second round um uh in terms of other day two picks guys that nobody's talking about okay malik washington okay tiny he is 5'9", 195, but because he's 5'9", that 195 goes a long way. Yeah, like he, he is that. thick. And like I was watching him at the Shrine Bowl, I interviewed him there. That dude is ripped beyond belief. Okay. Like he can take punishment and deliver punishment. Um, led the nation in catches, over 1,400 yards, great separator. Like I think he's going to be like a round three slot receiver for that people that miss out on the – you know, the Roman Wilsons or whatever. And he could he could play day one. Okay. Like I I think he could be like this year's Christian Kirk type, right? Okay. That can play day one. He's also really smart too. And then last one, Taj Washington. Oh yes. Fight on baby. Taylor Gabriel. That's what he is. A hundred percent. He's Taylor Gabriel. So much juice. Uh inside uh kind of slot fades. They use that a ton at SC. I think he can be a screen guy if you want him to. I thought he was straight up better than Brendan Rice. He is. In my opinion. Yeah. Uh, that's not where consensus rankings have them. I, I, watched I was him. even talking to a couple of his teammates, and they're like, yeah, Taj yeah. is Taj the guy. <laughs> Taj, yeah, he's limited in the ways he's going to win, but I've seen him win uh, a lot. So I'm with you on Taj watching. What else did you see from him? Really good route runner. Was beating people up in the one-on-ones. Didn't get as much opportunities to do that at USC because a lot of it's mm-hmm. like, hey, Taj, you run really fast. Go the run this USC deep cross. But, like, we saw him get to just ISO people up okay. at Shrine Bowl, and, like, nobody could touch him. Like, he's so quick, so fast. And I understand he's another lighter guy, which is why he's going to go probably in the third, fourth round. Mm-hmm. But if we're talking about taking a lighter receiver in the third or fourth round, I want a guy like Taj Washington who has 63% contested catch yeah. rate, you know, great tracker the ball deep down the field great separator reliable reliable like his profile exceeds a lot of the guys that are going to go ahead of him Mm -hmm. and that's why i think ultimately he's going to have a taylor gabriel type career love it where you know came out of quote unquote nowhere but was a really key contributor for some really good teams sleeper i'm kind of looking at is jermaine burton out of alabama very rare to call a alabama player a sleeper but for an outside receiver a little bit of a thicker frame. I thought he made a little bit more contested catches. Uh, he got in some trouble from time to time at Alabama, so something to keep an eye on. But he was used heavily when things really mattered, made a couple big plays in the Michigan game at the Rose Bowl. And I just thought that he would be able to get downfield. Uh, and some of the like versus Troy Franklin and Xavier Worthy, downfield guys. Burton at least has the frame, I think, to perhaps sneak into two wide receiver sets if things click out. So I'm very curious to see what he's going to be 
at the NFL Combine. We are running long, who would have guessed? So we're <laughs> going to skip out on the tight ends. I hope everybody's heard of Brock Bowers. Let's go to the running backs. No first round running backs. We'll kind of hit on like the top six ish names before Brett goes down the board to about running back 28 to make the case for. So my number one currently, Jonathan Brooks, kind of an every down player coming off the tour in ACL. It seems like when I was watching your podcast with Eric Galco that teams believe that he should be ready for week one and they're drafting him as if the ACL does not matter all that much. Uh, what else did you see from the Texas running back? So, file this one away. This is going to be our little secret. Cowboys? You, you, me, and everybody. What? Here's what people don't realize okay. about that. They did his surgery. The Cowboys team doctor did Jonathan Brooks' surgery. They have better information than anybody else on mm-hmm. where he's at. He was literally at the Cowboys facility during the Shrine Bowl. Wow. Like, they know him very well, and they are looking for a running back. And if he goes to the Dallas Cowboys, he will be a going R- RB1. 60th. RB1. Pick, even with the ACL concerns. Right now, an underdog, yes. if you're doing the big board drafts, he's like 130th, 140th overall, which makes no sense to me. I think people are scared off the ACL. But we've been drafting ACL running backs way higher than this. And this dude could be a three-down guy with Dak Prescott. It would be crazy. If he goes to the Cowboys and is like very clearly their RB1 from the moment he gets drafted, he's not going to be the 101 in Dynasty, but he ain't going to get past five. Right. Okay. So we're all in on Jonathan Brooks, uh, especially if he goes to the Cowboys. RB2, um, a player that I kind of liked so far, not the perfect player, but Florida State's Trey Benson. This is 220-ish pounds with the burst and the long speed. Now, to me, he bounces things outside a little bit too much, was not a full-time player at Florida State, so we have to figure out exactly why that was happening. But if he sees the right crease, he can absolutely rip it. So Trey Benson is kind of this size speed guy of this class off my first watch. I found his long speed fascinating because I'm not used to seeing somebody who's like 220 to 225. Mm -hmm. Like usually, okay, 10 to 15 yard burst, like it's there. Like that Tyler Algier, like I'll get you you to the second level. I'll get you a first down. (laughs) But there was a couple runs with Benson where it's like got to the second level. And it's like, okay, the safeties are going to – oh, God, no, they're not. There he goes. Yep. And I think that is such a unique thing for a guy his size because most running backs his size don't have Correct. pull away from you speed. Correct. He does. And I really like his feet, like his stop start. Again, sometimes sometimes he'll run himself into trouble a little, yes. a little quicker than he should because he's, he's, he's got such good feet. But like when he hits it, boy, he hits it. And if he is a home run threat, which he is, you want him to look for the home run type of play. So if he bounces a couple times, like my comp for him is he's on the Kenneth Walker plane. Kenneth Walker's feet, I think, were much better than Trey Benson's. His lateral ability, Kenneth Walker's, is special. Trey Benson's, not that way. But the home run threat that actually can take off a 60-yard touchdown, I do think Benson has that. Uh, guys that I did not think had that speed, Blake Corum and then Braylon Allen. Those are kind of the uh, power guys, can possibly c- handle 250 carries in an offense. We both obviously saw that from Michigan and Wisconsin. Between those two guys, did either one of them stand out to you? Braylon Allen is a diesel engine. You know, it could take a little bit to get going, but when it's going, mm-hmm. good luck, mm-hmm. right? It's 240 pounds. He's got pretty good feet for 240 pounds, he, too. He definitely does. <laughs> definitely does. But it's not the same acceleration or juice as people that are 15, 20 pounds, yep. 30 pounds, 40 pounds in some cases, lighter than him. Um, and so I think I think he will eventually be what people hoped A.J. Dillon was going to be, which is like that quality number two. And yep. no, no shade at A.J. Dillon, um, but I think Braylon Allen is, is going to end up being – what we what we hoped AJ was going to be right. That's fair. Give, give him 10, 12 carries. He'll be efficient with it. He'll be great in short yardage. Yep. All that kind of stuff. Um, is he dynamic enough to get the full full workload? I'm not sure about that. Um, I would bet against it. But I think as a quality number two, you know, say like a, a Brandon Jacobs to an Ahmad mm-hmm. Bradshaw, right? Mm-hmm. To to give a comp. That's 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 that. He caught 28 passes. Most of them were just like little flicks in the flats just because of the rest of the Wisconsin passing offense, historically, nothing too special. I thought his vision was good, which is good for a short yardage back. And I think that 
basically all that matter, matters for him. Uh, with Blake Corum, I just worry about the speed. I worry about the injury history. Uh, not a huge fan. I think he might be going a little bit drafted, just ba- overdrafted based off of the name value there. Let's let's talk positively about a player. Marshawn Lloyd out of USC. Love him. What's what's there to like? So he and Benson, uh, I'm gonna, I, I haven't made a determination on them yet in terms of like who the exact right because i i i just barely got into benson yep. where i was like oh hell yeah interesting that's great yeah. um but i have gotten a lot into into marshawn lloyd and i know what we're getting there which is a bigger back with phenomenal feet yes he does for his size just looking at the breakaway speed i would expect benson's going to run faster but i wouldn't be surprised if the agility drills marshawn lloyd yep. takes it so it's it's two different flavors of like a similar body type um I see Marshawn Lloyd coming out as a better version of what Miles Sanders was coming out of Penn State. Okay, I like that. It's a good starting point. Which, hey, I'll take that. Mm-hmm. Like that's an RB one in the NFL. Mm-hmm. This is this is a great comp because in my in my notes here, I said he had sweet cutting ability, which is what Miles had, uh, and he bounces plays outside probably too much. But I think with a little bit more experience, hopefully a little bit better poise. I think he can be a starter. He's got the size. He caught some passes out there. Uh, the fumbling and the bouncing plays outside were the negatives, but size, speed, and good feet, and decent enough in pass protection. I think we're looking at one of the uh, possible three down type of players. So, of this kind of list, I w- want to be drafting Marshawn Lloyd. Similar sized player. Audric Estime out of Notre Dame, more of a power back. I think the difference between those two is Estime just does not have the feet uh, or, or the, the speed, speed. <laughs> other things. <laughs> Estime maybe closer to like the Tyler Algier type to me. What else did you see from him? Uh, sentient Glacier in the sense that, hey, man, nothing's getting in the way. <laughs> yeah. But – you could outrun it. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, like he, he is a one speed guy, and that speed is not very fast, but mm-hmm. he will deliver punishment to whoever's in front of him. Yes. He actually had a lot of explosive runs, i.e., runs of 10 plus yards, but not a whole lot of runs more than 15 yards. And you it, have Joe Alt-, Alt to run behind. That helps. It's it's so funny how it's like so many of his gains where it's like 11, 12, yes. 13, and you're hunting for like the big, big ones, and it's like, oh, those. Those don't exist. That's very Notre Dame of him. <laughs> yes. It's very Kyron Williams, but yes. he's bigger than Kyron was. Yes, bigger than Kyron, not as effective through the air. So I think he's going to be kind of pigeonholed into that offense or that like kind of early down short yardage. But he's got good balance because he's so damn big. So I do think a short yardage role would make sense. Bucky Irving, Ray Davis, any of these other kind of potential round three picks before we get into the deep sleepers? <sighs> I struggle with Bucky, and I know he's going to get a lot of love. And, I, boy, he fights like hell on every mm-hmm. carry. He's 195 pounds. And if you're 195 pounds, I want to see, like, Javid Best type burst, elusiveness, agility. He's not there, right? I think he's a very solid number three in the NFL. Okay, so not, not even a number two. Depends on the landing spot, of course. It depends on the landing spot. February 11th, but 195 pound running backs without elite burst, right? It's it's tough. It like there is a path for success there. There is a path for him to be like a Boston Scott type. Okay, but even Boston Scott was bigger than Big him, dude. right? So right. it's it's just a tougher projection. Not saying he can't be or won't be, but statistically, it's a it's a profile that does not work that often. Right. So when I was watching Bucky, obviously the pass game is where he's going to make his bread. Uh, I thought that the shiftiness and burst were good enough to fill out that role. Did I think that it was special? I didn't get there. I thought like Devon Achan, for example, similar-ish styled player. I thought that he did not have that exact special sauce out there. The pass protection in my notes, I wrote he's a near zero just because of his size. Like mass matters when a blitzing linebacker is coming through the A gap, and he just did not have that. So I think that he's going to be kind of pigeonholed where he goes. Um, but we're starting to see this type of styled running back get 
very much featured in offenses. So I think that he's going to be very landing spot dependent. So do, do you think he could be like a theoretic? Yes, I think I no think, carries at all, only catches. I, I I do think that is possible. Uh, I thought he ran with a little bit more power for that type of uh, back, but to me it was just the raw burst and the exact lateral ability. I think it's a very high bar to be kind of put into that role and be like super fantasy productive but I do think it's just going to come down to the landing spot and how creative a deep uh, offensive coordinator will want to be um the reason why I was so pumped to do the show is because you were sending me players I'd never heard of and they were some running backs uh could you introduce us to these sleeper running backs please so I got a few okay uh I'll start with Isaac Arendo from Louisville wow former Wisconsin transfer 6'1 220 track star speed he and jonathan taylor he used to back up jonathan taylor um used to race and they were neck and neck and jt ran four three i think garendo you know if if he's coming in at like you know higher lower four four five i take the lower on that one okay uh he's got juice on juice on juice Wow. one out of every six carries went for an explosive gain at louisville now he was a five-year guy in college but he averaged 50 carries a year in college so he had some injury history um, but there's not a whole lot of tread taken off the tires. Okay. So if he stays healthy, he's burst. Oh my God, he's got burst. Okay. He averaged like over six yards a carry. Okay. And very good outside zone and inside zone runner. I can tell you from my personal observations, every team you can think of that runs a let's just say anything within the Shanahan family. <laughs> that tree is getting quite quite large so now. Half the NFL <laughs> right. was all over him okay. because he is one of the better outside zone runners in this class. I could see him being a Raheem Mostert type that Ooh. doesn't do a lot early in the career, but he's so athletic and is such a a rare physical profile that eventually, like Raheem Mostert, he will be appreciated for what he is, okay. and he'll get a chance. And once he gets that chance, it's going to be tough to keep him on the field. I have a uh, website up that has consensus rankings. They must have 60 running backs on here. He is not one of them. So if, if this guy hits, this will be one of the all-time calls for me. I'll tell you what. The NFL is very interested okay. in him. Okay. I, I will be watching as once I land back from Phoenix. Any other deep cuts before we move on? Um, let's see. Carson Steele from UCLA, another big back, big 225 dude. plus. Uh, moves a lot better than you expect for 225 plus. I think he moves better um then uh then Audrick from Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. Uh I think he's got a lot more wiggle than than he gets given credit for. It can also catch the ball pretty well too. Yes. Um I would say Isaiah Davis from South Dakota State, another one where bigger back, two twenty five plus this is the year of big running backs. Yes. Thankfully. More more wiggle than than Audric again, I would I would say. Okay. The one thing that's gonna get hold, held against him is that the South Dakota State offense. People don't think of like South Dakota State as an NFL factory. They had seven NFL players or future NFL players on that offense and this year. It's been like that for the last couple couple years. They smoked everybody. Okay. The left tackle and left guard are gonna be a top hundred pick each. The center is gonna be a top hundred pick next year. The Yankee twins are both going to be on NFL rosters next year. The tight end, Zach Hines, is 6'7", runs like a All deer. All tight ends with them. Best hands on the team. Okay. Like, I, the, Hines, we're talking about deep cut tight ends. Okay. Zach Hines, South Dakota right. State. And, of course, you got Isaiah Davis, the running back. Um, like He led the entire nation in explosive carries. It's like FBS or FCS. He had 56 explosive carries. Okay? Like, that's real. So these are all running backs that are either going to go the sixth round or potentially even undrafted in the NFL That's draft. That's a lot of them, just because teams are not valuing the position. So there, a lot of like what used to be fourth round picks are now seventh round picks. I'll tell you what: the same event where I saw Isaac Garendo is the same event where I saw Isaiah Pacheco two years ago. And he was a seventh round uh -oh. pick, and I said, "Hey, here's a 210 pound running back that runs four three. Yep. Watch out!" And now he's in the Super Bowl yep. again. Yeah. So. Uh, Brett does a fantastic job, not just like sitting there watching all the players, but watching them with the correct context, trying to find the exact landing spots, the exact role. And I think that's like the biggest thing for kind of fantasy football drafters that they kind of misapply is what exact role are they going to be playing in the NFL? And does that even matter to us in fantasy land? So make sure to watch all of Brett's videos. You probably 
already are. He's recorded about 30 of them at this house. I've recorded two. So he's just getting completely outworking me out here. So go make sure to follow him. Um, and we'll be back next year, maybe here in Super Bowls next uh, in New Orleans. So probably not coming back to Scottsdale, but uh, it's always very fun to be kicking with you. If if we go to Bourbon Street for the Super Bowl next year, I am not recording no, 30, yeah, not videos. 30 videos. That is not happening. <laughs> yeah, we're way out here in the, in the desert. There's not enough uh, bourbon uh, to, to go around for, for Brett's liking. So uh, we'll be out of here. Josh and I will we'll start doing prospect videos around the NFL Combine. I've done 30 prospects. Josh has done about one and a half. So uh, I'm at least outworking Josh. So on that note, uh, we'll get out of here later. Hey, thanks for watching. Before you go, be sure to check out the rest of the channel might find other clips that you'll enjoy, hit that subscribe button too. Free agency, NFL draft are on the way. And don't worry, we've got you covered.